Secretary of Defense, I couldn't believe after you know, having to deal with $487 billion in reductions that they were going to add another $500 billion in cuts. And I remember I went to the President, uh, and I went to the leadership in the Congress, uh, both on the House side and on the Senate side, Democrat and Republican. And I said, look, this can't happen. This is going to hurt our readiness. We won't be able to do maintenance. We won't be able to train. Uh, we're going to basically hollow out the military uh, if this happens. And everybody agreed. Everybody agreed. This is bad for America. So I said, OK, <laughs> bad for America. Maybe we ought to do something about it. You know, and I said, look, let's, let's sit down, you know, and try to work out a deal to stop sequester from happening. Uh, if, if you need a, another hundred million in, in defense savings, I'm willing to do that as part of a deal so that we can develop something more rational. Nothing happened, ladies and gentlemen, nothing happened. Which is, a, I think, an indication of the dysfunction in Washington. If you want to know what the greatest national security threat is in this country, it's the dysfunction in Washington. <laughs> and so nobody called a meeting. Nobody sat down in a room. Nobody tried to cut a deal to say this should not happen. They all sat back and sequester happened. And now what you're seeing is they'll, they'll try to de-trigger sequester for a couple years do this, but sequester, the shadow of sequester is still there, and it did go into effect, and it did hurt the military. I think that we've learned a lot of lessons, you know, I, we've been involved for 15 years now, since 9-11, uh, come this 9-11, uh, in the war on terrorism. We've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about counterterrorism. We've learned a lot about the use of special forces. We've learned a lot about how we can train and advise uh, and help other countries develop their security and their ability to deal with terrorism. Uh, so I think, I think we can do this. Mm -hmm. But it, it requires that not only do we make sure that we have uh, the support that's necessary to get this done, but we have got to build what I think is an alliance uh, in the Middle East that includes Israel, that includes our Arab uh, friends uh, in the Gulf, uh, that includes NATO. Uh, because right now what you're seeing is everybody is kind of doing their own thing. I mean, you know, if you look at Syria, uh, yeah. you've got, uh, you know, uh, some that are fighting Assad. Assad is fighting uh, others. Uh, you've got the Turks fighting the Kurds. The Kurds are trying to fight. I mean, there, there's all kinds of crossfire that's taking place here. The Saudis want to get involved. Russia is blowing the hell out of everybody. Um, you know, it's a very disjointed effort. Yep. Yeah. And to really try to do this, you've got to, you've got to develop a coordinated approach to this that involves, yes, the United States. I think the United States has to provide important leadership, but it has to involve others in the region who care about uh, the effort to try to go after Mm -hmm. ISIS and terrorism. Uh, that's the only way I think ultimately we're going to be successful because incidentally you can use that same coalition not only to help defeat them but to carry that larger message to young people yes. about why this is not the kind of choice they ought to make in terms of the yeah. future. Now, diplomatically, what the president has said is that boots on the ground would really just play to the ISIS narrative of it being the David to our Goliath. And so, first, I want to have a sense of whether you agree with that analysis. But then also, he's, um, he's put a lot of stock in the diplomatic process. And there was an announcement today yeah, yeah. Uh, in that regard. So I wonder, sense of, is that analysis right in your view, number one? And number two, what are the, are the right people at the table for uh, a negotiated uh, Yeah, solution? no, I, you know, look, I think, I think that, um, you know, there is no need to put another 150,000 troops uh, into another war in the Middle East. And I think the president's correct on that. Uh, having said that, I think if we are to defeat ISIS, we do need to, uh, uh, to continue to conduct uh, these airstrikes. I think we do need to increase uh, our special forces presence and our trainers and advisors. 
to try to develop uh, troop boots on the ground from these other Arab countries that can be effective, uh, I think, in regaining the territory that needs to be uh, achieved. I've been to the Middle East and talked to the leaders there, and they're very concerned about uh, what will happen there. They're very concerned about, uh, I mean, they are, Jordan has uh, taken in a, a large number of refugees. Turkey has taken in a large number of refugees. We obviously have this great refugee flow uh, that's going to Europe as well and, and to this country. Um, and the result is that they are worried that if this continues to happen without any resolution of the situation in Syria, that it will destabilize their countries. Yeah. Uh, and it will make it very difficult for them to maintain uh, their countries as they are. And so they're very worried about that and worried about what will we do in order to try to make sure that somehow we resolve this terrible situation in and, Syria. Well, and, and failure on, any, on the part of any of those three states would be disastrous for us. That's right. I mean, we've already, you know, we've already seen a number of failed states in the Middle East. We don't need any more. We had no intelligence by the way, on Benghazi or the fact that uh, an attack would take place there. And um, on 9-11, on when uh, it did occur, I was, uh, you know, I was on my way to talk to the president. Uh, and uh, we have regular meetings with the president, uh, both uh, General Dempsey and I, uh, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs and I, had regular meetings. And so uh, we, we went over to meet with the president. Just before we went there, I was told that there was this attack going on in Benghazi uh, and that um, you know, there was some concern about, uh, they, they knew that the ambassador was there uh, and were not quite sure what was happening. Uh, so when I went into the Oval Office, uh, sat down with the president, uh, and one of the first things uh, that General Dempsey and I told him was that we had just gotten information about an attack that was taking place uh, in Benghazi uh, and that we didn't have uh, very, very good information about exactly what was taking place, but it raised a lot of concerns. Uh, and the president said, uh, uh, I want you to do everything you can to try to uh, make sure we, we help uh, the, our people there uh, and do whatever we can. Uh, and uh, I went back to uh, the Defense Department. We left the meeting early. Uh, went back to the Defense Department, sat down, with uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and my other military aides. Uh, and the decision uh, was made to, uh, to immediately uh, send orders out that would deploy uh, our special operations units uh, to, be, to go uh, and try to uh, rescue those involved in Benghazi. So we had uh, units uh, located uh, in, uh, in Spain uh, at our base there. We had a unit, a rescue unit, a hostage rescue unit that was located in the United States that we issued orders to deploy uh, over there. We also had another unit uh, that was located uh, in Europe as well. All of them were ordered to uh, get into place. Uh, the court has ordered Apple to assist and Apple has said no. Who's right? Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, in, our, in our country, uh, and I know that everybody always tries to make it a black and white situation, but the reality is we do not have to choose between protecting our security and protecting our freedoms. We can do both uh, in this country. Uh, we're great enough that uh, we have the ability to do both. Neither party comes to this kind of issue with clean hands. Um, you know, the, the reality is that the Democrats, uh, when they were in power, and uh, you know, uh, created a lot of barriers to uh, Republican presidents who were nominating uh, justices, and uh, Republicans have now done the same thing with regards to a Democratic mm -hmm. president. But I, I, I wish both sides would understand that they're elected in order to govern this country, uh, and that the Constitution requires that the president should take the step to uh, fill that vacancy. He, he has the right under the Constitution to name an individual to the court. Uh, the Republicans uh, in the Senate side 
uh, ought to uh, take that nomination, uh, bring it to a hearing, have a hearing on it, uh, and then ultimately, hopefully, bring it to the floor of the Senate where a vote will be held. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point, there are those that will vote for it and those who will vote against it. But for goodness sakes, uh, let's not try to, you know, there's a danger here. You've got dysfunction on the part of the executive branch. You've got dysfunction on part of the Congress. Uh, they can't work together to resolve issues. The last damn thing we need is a dysfunctional court. I really believe that we have a responsibility to uh, protect our oceans. Our oceans are a great treasure. Uh, and, you know, they're important to our economy. They're important to our life. They're important to our very spirit. I think it was John Kennedy who said that our oceans are the salt in our veins. Uh, and I believe that. Uh, I think we have a responsibility to do everything we can in order to protect our coastlines. They're under threat because of pollution, because of, of climate change and the different currents that are now creating dead zones in the ocean. Uh, they're under threat uh, as a result of, of you know, the fishing that's there. We're losing a lot of the uh, fishing resources that were there. We have to develop sustainable fisheries. Uh, there's a whole set of steps we have to take in order to protect our oceans that we have to get the world to participate in. But look, we, we live on this earth for a short period of time. We have a responsibility to make sure that we are good stewards of what God gave us and that we can pass that on to our children. So I've got... And we're going we're gonna to turn this back over to Secretary you know, Schultz. What, uh, what we have to do in this country is just sit down with Leon Panetta, figure out what's good for the country, and do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Leon. Thank you, Thank James. You, Great.